Hello, everyone, and welcome to Super Stonk Brothers, episode number nine. Today, we are going to talk about Zynga. We will cover some of the highlights from the recent quarterly earnings call and talk about valuation, future prospects, and the acquisition of Chartboost. So today, we have actually a special guest again, Matthew Contraman, who joined us last week when we talked about skills. But due to popular demand, Matthew, you're back. And actually, Zynga, you actually do officially cover. Is that right? Correct. Bloomberg? Correct. So this is this is much more in my wheelhouse. So I couldn't say no to this and say yes to skills. <laughs> so you got you, you bait and switched me. We're, right. we're lucky to have you, man. So in terms of the agenda topics for today, we'll talk about Zynga's current business, games, major sources of revenue. Second, highlights from the Q1 earnings call. Third, the acquisition of Chartboost and the potential implications of that strategy to their business. And finally, future prospects and what are the potential sources of growth. And so kind of just starting in terms of the first agenda item, I wanted to share my screen here. So as far as Zynga's current business, and I just took some slides from the quarterly earnings call presentation, you can see here that Zynga, as it has for the last five, six, however many years has shown consistent increases in terms of total revenue and and against bookings. And we'll talk about the differences about that. They actually provide a nice slide generally that graph visually depicts the difference between revenue and bookings. Advertising revenue jumped up quite a bit, especially in Q4 and uh, this last quarter. And as far as the mix of revenue, one thing to note is that when we look at the mix of forever franchise revenue, it's actually a pretty significant proportion of the overall revenue mix. And what that means is that from a stability perspective, you have to think that Zynga relative to other gaming companies has very good stability as far as the revenue is concerned. Like these forever franchises, whether it's Zynga Poker, whether it's uh, even CSR Racing and these other games are games that have been operating for many, many years. Words with friends, 10 plus years and continue to generate revenue in some cases have seen highs, especially when when we looked at the performance of games in 2020. So those are kind of the highlights in terms of the revenue by geography. We noticed that a lot of the revenue is still uh, US-based relative to international revenue. And you can view that. So here in the, the darker color is US revenue versus international revenue. And you could view that both as a positive and negative. The positive side would be to say that from an international expansion perspective, that Zynga potentially has more ways to run in terms of expanding their their revenues geographically. I don't know if we want to go into this too much, gap versus non-gap reconciliation, but just a couple of things to note is that uh, when it comes to like acquisition-related transaction expenses, there's not too much, I would say, However, contingent consideration, fair value adjustment. So this was, and, and Matthew, I know I, I asked you a question about this before the call, but you know my understanding of this would be expenses, or basically the expenses related to, for example, earnouts, and for example, Small Giant, which had a fairly significant earnout, just based upon the performance of Empires and Puzzles, there would have to be some allocation or an adjustment in terms of how much money would be paid out to that studio. Yeah, and so then, it's not it's not the actual amount they're paying, right? right? It's the balance sheet liability associated with what they think they're going to have to pay out right. in the future. Right. And so a lot of companies do these adjustments to show you a cash on cash effectively. And so because that's not a cash item yet, it could be a cash item in the future. That's why it gets adjusted out. And right. and to be clear, they want it to be a cash item, right? Because that means that these studios have hit their incentives and their performance targets, right? It's good for everybody. Yeah, I mean, Joe, I know you and uh, the other podcast guys have talked to some of the former Zynga people about kind of setting these these targets and making them achievable. You want them to be tough targets, but you want them to be achievable because if you make them too tough so you never pay them, no one's going to work for you. <laughs> <laughs> right. just leave. But having said that, it does seem like kind of word on the street was Zynga is going to start to back off from a lot of the earnout based approach, at least since small time, since they, they paid out so much on, on that deal. One thing to note in terms of the difference between revenue and bookings, you can see that essentially the way that Zynga does it is, and they provide a very great graphic here that kind of explains the difference, is that if you were to for example, if a customer were to pay $100 for an IAP purchase, then you would basically book $10 in that month and then $10 a month for the next, for 10 months in total. And so you're allocating 
the bookings as revenue over a 10 month period and different companies have different policies against this. And so it's one of the reasons why looking at and just an EBITDA number, for example, is a better way of comparison. Although I won't go into like the specifics of, you know, whether you want to add back things like stock-based comp and earn out stuff and things of that nature. But just, just for my own comprehension, bookings kind of equates to cash flow, as I understand it. And Closer, revenue yeah. like is deferred because you buy all this virtual currency in a mobile game. And then there's some sort of average pacing by which an average player pays you back that virtual currency and you recognize the revenue in an accounting it's, sense. It's, it's not only the rate at which they pay you back, it's the rate at which they derive value from the stuff they buy within Got the it. game. Yep. So like in a more core game like Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes, which I've spent far too much money in to admit, if you wail on stuff to get like the new GL character, like, you know, the new meta character, you're going to get value from that meta character until the next meta turns over. And mm -hmm. so is it not, it's not only the time between when you actually spend cash dollars versus spend the in-game currency, it's then the time that you get the value from what you've spent that currency on as well. Got it. Makes sense. Thank you. Right. And then in terms of, I would say, the games that are performing for Zynga, we can see here that some of the, this is from Sensor Tower data, so this is estimated just for our audience, but you can see like the biggest games are like Tomb Blast, Empires and Puzzles, Merge Dragons, Toy Blast, Zynga Poker, CSR2, Wizard of Oz, Hit It Rich, and Merge Magic. And it does seem like some of the other, just to also talk about geographical reasons, as we noted before, that the US is the highest, and then it looks like uh, besides that, Japan, Germany, Great Britain, Canada, Australia are next. And um, some of these countries make a lot of sense in terms of, especially when you have a casino or, or slots based portfolio that you would skew more towards English speaking countries, for example. And there's two things to note there just for our audience, mm -hmm. especially when you're looking at the, the apps breakdown. This is pro forma yeah. for all the M&A they do. We can talk about this, but Zynga is a highly acquis acquisitive company. Um, mm -hmm. So a, a lot of those Toon Blast, Empire, actually most of the top games you see there, the top four games have all been acquired in the last you know two to three years. They're, mm -hmm. they're not made by Zynga. Is the big Japanese game Merch Dragons? Uh, I think it's Empires and Puzzles is popular Empires and Puzzles, Japan. got it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So yeah, that's basically in, in terms of like a high level overview of Zynga, that's kind of what I was able to pull away from just the, the earnings call. And just wanted to kind of turn it over to you guys as far as the earnings call. Was there anything of particular note that you guys think is important for our audience to be aware of or any other aspects of the business that the audience should know about? I would just say if you go back in the last, you know, basically since the new management team took over in what was it around 2016, Frank Chabot became CEO and brought in, you know, he's a former exec from EA's mobile business. He brought in like a dozen or so other senior people that he worked with at EA and, re and restocked the ranks at, at Zynga. And this, they had Farmville, which was still generating a lot of cash, but it was obviously declining because they missed the move to mobile when Facebook's MAUs and DAUs all moved to mobile. And so they went out and said, hey, we have this cash. We need to go buy assets that can be productive in the future because we don't have the resources internally to build mobile games. And that's what they did. They, they, they did a lot of M&A. Some of it was successful. Some of it wasn't. If our friend Eric Kress was on with us today, he would tell us that Natural Motion was a horrible acquisition, but they did produce a solid game in CSR. I think also from a technical perspective, they brought a lot of tools that helped Zynga create more of their mid-core and core mobile games. Um, and over the years, you know, they've they've done increasingly larger and larger uh, acquisitions that have been successful. A lot of those big games. Um, but now we're kind of at an inflection point for, Zy for Zynga where it seems like they've milked the M&A well as much as they want to. And now they've kind of built out all these various city states with all of these studio organizations from their M&A, as well as their internal studios that they've built organically. And now they really are shifting back to organic growth, back to developing games, launching their own games and scaling those as their next forever franchises, as opposed to buying promising games that can become forever franchises. Right. And I think that's a point that should probably be underscored in that I don't think a lot of investors fully appreciate, which is 
there were a couple of things that happened. So to your point, like if you look at the growth in, in terms of Zynga's business, it's almost like almost all of it is from, from M&A. And the guy behind it, Chris Petrovic, is you know a, a friend of ours and I actually have hosted some podcasts with him before. But I would say a couple of things happened that allowed Chris to be successful and Zynga to be successful in the past five to, five to six years, which has now changed. And so what I would say that Zynga in their earlier days, had an M&A strategy against a lot of different type of companies. And they didn't really test for cultural fit. But the I would say the single biggest difference, in my opinion, was, uh, well, actually, probably two things. One, they used to try and acquire earlier stage companies rather than later mm-hmm. stage companies where there's a lot less risk in terms of how the company how the the games and these companies do post acquisition. And then secondly, they used to be more interventionist in terms of, oh, we're publishing, we kind of know everything. And then really started meddling into the acquired studios business. And so they kind of backed off of that and had more of this decentralized, what what you're calling city state approach. And so I think both of those things had enabled this kind of growth in terms of M&A. I think the other thing that happened was if, if we look at the overall environment, low interest rate, easier to get debt financing, I would say that uh, the other thing that happened was we saw like this arbitrage in terms of uh, private company valuations, public company valuations. And so there was like this, there was these great tailwinds behind M&A, which led to a lot of companies being taken out. But what's different now, and Chris Petrovic is no longer at Zynga, kind of leading that chart, and he was responsible for, I would say, almost every sing- single one of their big acquisitions, is that... If we look at the ecosystem of game companies, let's say early stage, mid stage and bigger in terms of scale, like because of Zynga, you know, because of all these other consolidators, Stillfront, EG7, Embracer, all these groups that have taken out all of the, the kind of lower hanging fruit, like the middle is relatively sparse, right? Like the companies that are left are problem companies, super high valuations, you know, geographical risk or other types of risks that are involved. And so now you're having to move down or you're having to move up. And remember when Zynga went down, they had a lot of problems. And, you know, going up, it becomes very expensive. We saw EA acquire glue. And so just this ability to your point, Matthew, of being able to continue growth through M&A is fundamentally, in my opinion, fundamentally challenged. And so then we have to think, okay, if in terms of growth, where do they go? And we can talk about that um, a little bit later or even now, but that's a big question. That's why I, I know a lot of folks are super bullish on Zynga. I am less bullish because I'm not sure what those growth drivers are, or I'm not as confident in those growth drivers. I still think over the next year, two years, Zynga is going to be fine. But like, it's almost as if Zynga has been being pushed by this huge wave of m and so forth. And then that person pushing is no longer there. It's like, are you going to be able to run as fast? I don't think so. But I, I don't know. What, what, are you, what are your thoughts? Oh, I, I would also add just briefly, not only is that middle tier, that sweet spot for M&A gone, but now you have all of these other mobile publishers that are IPOing, um, that are roughly comparably sized to Zynga, slightly smaller, and they're raising money saying, we're going to go buy stuff too. So not only is that, the, is the well drying up, but there's also so much more competition for deals. Um, and I just think Zynga's being financially prudent and saying, if valuations are going to go too high, we're just, we're better off building out internal studios organically and hiring talent, um, doing some aqua hire type stuff. They, they did an acquisition. I f- can't pronounce the name of the company. It's with an E recently, but extra. You, yeah, extra, extra. Thank you. It seems like they're doing more of this type of aqua hire type stuff. I mean, chart boost is kind of in a separate category and we could talk about that as well, but I think you'll see more of that from Zynga um, just because, you know, where they're going now, more of an organic growth story. Those types of aqua hire type deals make a lot more sense when, when you're focused on building teams and building more studio scale. If you've denuded kind of the middle of the market in that kind of 100 million to $1 billion range of acquisition or whatever it may be, 500 million, right? That mid-sized company, uh, that's kind of the sweet spot where um, you don't have to pay enormous valuation for like proven performance <laughs> or take on the risk of taking on small fry and kind of like helping them grow up. That's kind of difficult, right? Um, you have to replenish that middle category somehow, right? And I think 
what you're saying, Matthew, about, well, we're going to do some internal growth, right? Um, we're going to do aqua hire. We're going to try to spin up internal studios. That's one thing. But I also think that the chart boost acquisition is a big piece of this in terms of the ability to proactively identify small studios that will work with the players that they already have um, using data type black magic, basically, and then go to them and say, hey, like we've identified a synergy. You guys want to get on board? Uh, we can blow you up and you're going to get a lot richer if you're with us and we'll take some of that, right? Um, but we have these players for you. Um, so that's another, I think, emergent part of the strategy because I agree with you, yeah. Joe. Like uh, they, they, they have to pivot somewhat and they either have to pivot internationally, which we can talk about. They have to pivot uh, to consoles and PCs, which you know is another part of the growth strategy or they have to figure out how to use chart boost, right? Um, in order to sort of uh, replenish uh, the that middle tier of, of material uh, that uh, makes them commercially successful. So maybe we could talk about like just transitioning there. Let, we, we could talk about chart boost and in, a, in essence, chart boost is a DSP SSP ad network. I mean, Steve, do you want to like kind of explain to the audience? Maybe you're, you're the best suited to explain what is a DSP relative to an SSP related versus, you know, ad network and so forth. Oh my God, where's my cheat sheet? <laughs> <laughs> right. So a demand side platform is basically, uh, you know, as I understand it, an open auction whereby you have inventory, right? People come on to your platform and provide inventory more or less uh, on an open market. And then others come in and decide whether or not to acquire that inventory at the given price, right? Um, so it is fairly hands-off and it's mediated through an SDK, right? Basically, whoever is advertising uh, is, is going to be installing that SDK to display those ads, right? Through the demand side platform based on a bidding structure, right? And if that system works right, everybody gets paid and value gets moved around because the advertisers get the players that they want, right? Uh, they pay the market price for those players uh, and they're able to monetize them, right? Um, so Chartboost has that technology and the company I work for, when I actually started in mobile games or free to play mobile games back in 2015, Chartboost was a big partner for us, right? Um, because we could do so-called direct deals where we could reach out directly to publishers or ad providers, right? Uh, in their games and say, Hey, it looks like your audience is very similar to our audience. We will pay you X amount for one of your users effectively, right? And you kind of arbitrage that. Uh, and so that's kind of what Chart Boost has been about historically. Now, my understanding is that over time, Chart Boost has kind of gone from a top tier ad network to sort of a middle to lower tier ad network, uh, especially as the self attributing networks such as Facebook, Google, and now the new crop <laughs> of like Snapchat and so on has kind of eaten into their business, but especially Facebook and Google, right? Because Chart Boost was never able to match uh, those kind of uh, like behavioral or demographic targeting profiles and still is not able to do that. Um, so a lot of that value kind of melted away. And what you saw in the earnings call, there were a bunch of questions asked about Chartboost and Zynga bought Chartboost for about $250 million. And I believe it was Frank who mentioned that this represented a high single digit multiple against revenues. Uh, and I got to think that's way down over time. Irregardless of whether you think like in a vacuum, that was a good buy, there's a bunch of things they can do with it, right? Um, they can turn around and use it to improve ad serving in their own games, but I don't really think that's a long-term play with what they're doing with Chartboost. I think they're actually going to use Chartboost more or less as a part of their acquisition strategy over time. And I think that they're using it to expand the walls of their walled garden more particularly, and it's going to work something like this. It's very similar to what App 11 is doing. And they didn't actually say a lot on, on this strategy during their earnings call, except to say that we expect to use Chartboost to leverage our first party data. And I believe that Frank mentioned this two or three times in the call. And if you weren't reading carefully, you might've missed it, right? And what he means by that is we understand based on our first party data, which is very granular, uh, what kinds of players do well in our games, right? Um, now, if we send ads to third-party studios, smaller studios that we think might represent good acquisition targets, we can then see how those ads uh, basically do in those games 
And we can interpolate those results and understand whether those games uh, will, will uh, like basically function well in our walled garden. So we will take that game and bring it to our players, more or less, um, instead of trying to acquire players for our game. It's, it's actually the other way around, right? Um, which is pretty interesting, uh, and it represents an inversion of how mobile game economics has, has worked to this point. Um, but it's what you see app loving doing. It's what you see iron source doing. Uh, and it's now kind of what I think you're going to see Zynga doing, but it's going to take them a couple years in order to really get this going. In my opinion. Um, what do you guys think? I totally, yeah. I totally agree. I, th I think this walled fortress model is the future of mobile games in a post IDFA world. And eventually Google is going to change GAID. They won't be first, but once everyone figures out how to operate within an ATT network, we're going down the rabbit hole of ad tech right now. But, you know, <laughs> Apple's changing the privacy rules. And, you know, once people figure out how to operate in that post IDFA world, Google will make the same change. And, you know, and then and then people will need the large publishers with these walled gardens won't have to necessarily rely on external UA because they're going to be able to cross promote within an ecosystem. And, you know, one of the numbers they called out is that Chartboost has 700 million monthly active users within their ecosystem, people playing mm -hmm. games. And that's not Facebook scale. That's not Google scale, but that's, that's sizable. I mean, it's not, it's not quite as big as App Lovin'. I think App Lovin's over, they only disclose DAUs, but their DAUs are almost as large as, as Chartboost MAUs. So you have to assume that their MAUs are much bigger, but still it gives Zynga decent scale you know zynga by itself has about 160 million mau so it's it's much bigger than zynga's reach is today and so when you combine the reach plus the technology to be able to process all the first party data like you're talking about um i think it becomes a really good you know ua funnel for them going forward even if all of the customers of chart boost decide to give up on it because now that's a competitor to them yeah so i think there's two really important concepts that investors need to understand when it comes to the acquisition of chart boost. Now, the first part you alluded to, Steve, which is when you have an ad network, you have competitive advantage against other people, other game studios, right? Because you'll know stuff like, you know, what games are actually performing well. You'll see the ad spend of different ad companies against different types of games. You'll also be able to see how well various perform various creatives perform against those games, the exactly. IPM installs per million. But and so that's one area of competitive advantage to, to your point where if you want to identify smaller companies that are emerging that are potential acquisition targets, yes, they will have competitive advantage. Now, the question around that is if you are a, a competitive game studio, will you want to participate in Zynga's ad network given that you're going to be giving them access to this data? To some degree, if they become big enough, you may not have a choice, right? It's, exactly. It's like yeah. Playrix, who, who's trying to get App Lovin traffic, despite the fact that they really feel that they got burned by App Lovin. Did they really <laughs> did? By the way, but yeah, no, it, it, it's like it's it's going to be an offer you can't refuse, right? Because um, you're either going to do that, and Zynga or App Lovin or somebody is going to make you a great offer compared to whatever you're going to be paying Facebook, right, <laughs> or Google. So that's you a know. that's a scale game, which we'll have to see whether that plays out or not. If they don't get there, that could really bite them in the ass. Now, this, mm -hmm. this second concept that's really important is this notion of the walled garden, and this is something that we didn't talk about enough on, on when we discussed App Lovin. But I yeah. do think, in my opinion. Just if we're to believe App Love and if we're to believe Frank Jabot's comments, and he said, and I've got his quote here, that they are intending to meaningfully grow our advertising revenue bookings. Now, if that's true, then their strategy would be fundamentally different from App Love. Yes. Let, let me explain yeah. that. So what is this notion of a walled garden? The wall garden. So, so first of all, when App Lovin talks about their business and they talk about all the machine learning that they have, the number of predictions they do, is, which is like, you know, billions or trillions or however many they're doing per day, it's massive. And they talk about building the Netflix for gaming, meaning that the ads, right, because they don't own the store. They don't own an ad that you go in and then you cross promote different things. They own the ad. So the ads is the platform upon which you're driving your player base from game to game. Yep. So the Netflix aspect of it is ads. It's ads as a platform. Now, what that means is that, okay, so there's kind of 
two models here. If you're a walled garden, then you don't derive any revenue from ad. That goes to zero. That means that the ad portion, the Netflix for gaming part, will go to increasing your margin on your IAP business. And this is something that a lot of even like expert gaming people really just don't understand, right? That in a walled garden scenario, there is no ad revenue. It goes, it, it's got to be generated from the IAPs. And so I don't know if Zynga plans on trying to still have this ad network that supports you know, external parties or to go with what App11 is presumably saying. But the other hint that we have in terms of where you would where you would want to go is what they do with an MMP. Because what does an MMP do? That's the data provider. Yeah. Yeah. Measurement. Because because I do think that what people like the capability that's kind of the holy grail is something that I've talked about a lot on the you know Twig podcast. But is this notion of auto ROAS that if you can connect the ARPU profiles that MMPs have that data then you could try and marry those together where you're you're where as as an ad buyer i could say i'm going to give you a roas and then i'm just going to throw you as much budget as i can and just fulfill that roas target for me and if you have that product that's that's magic right that's yeah. that's where you'll you'll get tons and tons and tons and tons of money now to to be clear facebook and google both have that product <laughs> right and so yeah. Like, you know, Facebook's, depending on who you well, ask. Do they have it anymore? Like, they, they don't, not anymore. Well, <laughs> yeah, not not as much, right? Um, Google still has it for a while until they decide to um, do a post IDFA thing over on Android, which they haven't yet. And they may do something a little bit different. Uh, my understanding is that they'll probably do something a little bit less stringent um, so that their, their advertising will work a little bit better um, on Android. Uh, they'll do as, you know, as little as as they can get away with more or less to basically gain a competitive advantage over both Apple and Facebook at the same time. Um, if they, if they thread this needle correctly, I think that's neither here nor there. That's Google. It's interesting to think that you talk about auto ROAS, right? And, and that is about customers coming in and paying you to send them the right players, right? Another way to think about it is again, to invert it, right? And to more, efficiently distribute players you know everything about to the correct games and to acquire the games um, that you've learned about and basically not make money from a customer that way, but to grow the size of your internal pie by maximizing lifetime LTV of each of your players and making sure that they don't churn out of the system, more or less. It's, it's retaining them in the system and it's, a, it's effectively a churn limitation model which is similar to what Netflix does, right? Uh, in that Netflix is subscription based, and you know, Zynga is not. It's primarily free to play, but you can think about it in the same way now. Um, in that, it's not about just acquiring a customer and then uh, you know monetizing them once and then expecting them to churn after a certain amount of time. It's about keeping them spinning as long as you possibly can with like new games, right? And I know exactly who you are, right? And I know what you like to play. So here's another game for you that I actually just acquired for like, you know, $100 million or whatever it's going to be, right? You can even do a thing where I don't acquire a game. I actually send you to a third party that I've made a deal with, right? <laughs> and the deal is, well, if this player monetizes in your game, like you weren't going to get this player, right? Demonstrably. So we're going to split whatever additional revenue accrues from this player that you wouldn't have gotten, right? Um, and they will be able to do that math and do those types of deals, I think. I think App Loving will as well. And that could be another sort of way around the uh, acquisition, the lack of acquisitions that you were talking about earlier. Okay. App Loving does do that. They have those third party partner studios that they talk about. But like to Joe's point about being able to, to grow ad revenue. I just wanted to point out that in 2019, after App Lovin officially started Lion Studios and got into game publishing, first party game publishing, their total number of enterprise clients, so those are the people buying over $100,000 of content from them, fell by 13%. They lost 25 of those customers, but that's a net total. That includes all the customers they added. If you probably, if you want to get a true churn number, it was probably double that. They probably lost about a quarter of their 
of their of their user base. Um, and how big they, were the like how big were the studios that they lost versus the ones that they gained? They right? were all spending over a hundred. I mean, they were yeah. all spending over a hundred thousand dollars at least a year. So you know, not chump change. So you know, it's I I could totally see something similar happening to Zynga. I think that the the caveat being that Chart Boost customers are a lot smaller than AppLovin's customers. AppLovin had some of the biggest mobile game publishers in the world working with them. Yeah. Um, you know, Chart Boost has Tactile, Outfit Seven. Not trying to demean these companies because they're great companies, but they're not at the size of King. Yeah. And that's a hint Tencent, right there, etc. That's a hint right there, right? It's Chart Boost is not the ad network you're going to try to acquire if you're interested in growing your ads business, right? <laughs> Cause they don't have the customers. So you just, you, yeah, you're absolutely right. You have to go out and like actually build up the ad business again. Like who wants to do that? No, like do something way better, right? Do the walled garden. It makes more sense anyway, at this point. So it also makes sense that they wouldn't want to talk about it though. Right. <laughs> Everybody knows they're going to do it. So it's like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, you never buy something and say, we're going to torch this business down to the ground and build a, you know, just use the technology. That's, that's not how, that's not how you sell that to investors, but, exactly. you know, I, I think there will be, I think there can be a lot of value from building a walled garden, um, even if the revenue of chart boost declines demonstrably. Like, I still think the ROI, see the IRR in this acquisition can be very good, even if there is a 25% decline in chart boost revenue because of attrition. So maybe just to uh, like go to our final section here in terms of future prospects, what, where do we see the sources of growth and what do we think? I mean, and Matthew, on Zynga, I assume you guys do have an official position or official sort of price target so, yeah. or something like that? No, we don't have, we don't have oh, ratings okay. and price targets. But I think for me, for Zynga, you know, I said it in the beginning, right, that this is shifting to an organic growth story. Now it's you know, they've got a lot of games in the pipeline. They're planning to release three big games this year. You know, they've got Farmville 3. Yeah. They've got the skin of them. What not, what is, what's the new small giant games? It's oh, the yeah. skin of the other game. And then they've got <laughs> the Star Wars game. Star Wars um, Hunters. Yeah. Yes. And, and Star Wars is probably the most important of the three. Yeah. I think Farmville is interesting just because there's still going to be a lot of people out there that remember Farmville from the Facebook days. And there's never been yeah. truly a mobile first version built of Farmville. And so I think that can be a decent game just because they know how to manage that as a live op. You know, they just haven't built it for mobile. And so I'm I'm fully confident that will become, a, you know, close to a forever franchise, if not one already. Not to mention that on that slide where you showed forever franchises, the Harry Potter match three game is not included in there yet because it hasn't lapsed a full year. They don't include it as a forever franchise until a year after release. So I have no doubt that Harry Potter will join that cohort soon. Mm -hmm. But I think for Star Wars, this is this is one of the big tests of their ability to target cross-platform. And this is something that they've been talking about for probably a couple quarters now, um, is expanding beyond mobile to cross-platform. This is why they bought Extra Games, um, who is a, a specialist in an Unreal Engine cross-platform development. Um, this is why they're building the Star Wars game, and it's coming out on Nintendo Switch and mobile at the same time. But Theoretically, it could also come to other platforms down the road because Unreal Engine 4 can publish on any platform that's known to man right now, including your refrigerator. I think as they look down the road, they want to move up the, the quality scale and to you know, have more core games. The Star Wars game checks that box because you get more of the hardcore users. Um, but then it also expands you into Switch, which is a huge platform now. They just crossed an 80 million install base, and there'll be mm -hmm. over 100 million by this time next year. Um, and then you also get the burgeoning other console ecosystem, the new Xboxes, the PS5, plus all of the 8th gen consoles. And PC is still vibrant as ever. You know, of all the doom and gloom about gaming engagement fading after COVID, Steam's peak concurrent users keep going up and are higher than they were in 2Q of 20 right now. Yeah, and for anyone who hasn't looked at the Fortnite data from the Apple Epic trial, we see that actually on console, especially PS4 and Xbox, like the, the revenues that you can generate relative to mobile are quite high. That blew so, my mind. Yeah, PS4 yeah. revenue, it like was 144 million versus 23 million from iOS. It's like, oh, now I get it. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was like almost 50%, like 40 something percent relative to like a 7% for iOS for Fortnite. But, yeah. When I think about Zynga, the, the growth opportunities seem to be what we're talking about, cross-platform, international, and then if they're able to 
carve out some kind of competitive advantage based upon the moves that, that they're going into as far as like integrating ad tech somehow post IDFA. So the way that I think about it though, is that the, the ad stuff is still very, very uncertain. International, I would give them the most credit for in terms of the ability to just like continue to, you know, build out internationally slowly, but I don't think it's huge growth. And then cross-platform, I'm a little bit more skeptical about the way that the Zynga guys were talking about it. It almost sounded like they were Star Wars was a MOBA, which I think if it is, then they'll be in trouble. <laughs> we don't we don't know anything we don't about know. it at we don't this know. point. We just know the name and we saw yeah. like a 15 second teaser trailer. Yeah. We yeah. we know that Ektra is run by one of the head designers of Diablo 2. Well, well, and also Ektra, the- Ektra is they, they announced that. That's an that's an ARPG. Okay, got it, got it. My bad. Yeah, yeah. and that Ek- will also Ek- be cross platform. Ek- but yeah, we we don't know anything about this game yet. It's kind of hard to make a call on it until we actually see it. And MOBAs haven't really done well. The caveat being MOBAs do extremely well in Asia. And so if you're really trying to expand in Asia, a Star Wars MOBA is actually a great way to go about that. But I think on the international front, you know, it's really only been Empire and Puzzles that's taken off for Zynga. And that's right. because that's the game that has the most RPG elements within it. And in, in when you look at Zynga's portfolio, yes, it's a match three game, but it has a lot of RPG elements about building squads and customizing them with all the different tools and, and power-ups and everything. Um, and if you look at just the mobile game space in Asia, it's a lot more core and hardcore than the West, which is much more casual. Um, you know, yeah. Call of Duty, Fortnite kind of breaking the mold in the West, but you still look at the dominance of casual games in the West relative to Asia. Um you know, so there is a genre difference. You know, a lot of the games that Zynga publishes are in the that casual category. And so this is where I think the cross-platform plus international, I think they kind of overlap in this case in the sense that you're not going to make a match three game for a Nintendo Switch and for Xbox, right? That's just stupid. Yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, you have to make these much more of a core audience focus yeah. anyways. And that's also going to play well in Asia, um, Japan has been a target market. Japan is also a huge switch market. Makes a lot of sense to put your game on switch there. Korea, you know, also in the same boat. China is its own beast. People probably know that you can't publish anything in China without the blessing of the Chinese government. There is a caveat that the switch just got approved and, you know, Tencent could help them cut a deal because Tencent is overseeing the switch within the Chinese, uh, within China. Um, So, you know, maybe there's opportunity for them to publish that for the switch Um, in China down the road. Who knows? You know, they got to make the game actually show us what it looks like first. Right. In in terms of the risks or the the headwinds, I just think because the whole M&A, you know, boom is over. No more M and A tailwinds for them. I I just see so much risk for continued growth for Zynga, in my personal opinion. And then on that earnings call, one of the analysts asked Gare about growth from core titles, and he kind of danced around and kind of ninja smoke bombed on that one, and just kind of <laughs> like didn't respond. And so, to your point, like, can Zynga organically build and grow new games? I think they're going to be challenged on that, not to cover the amount of growth that they had seen before. And the other thing that should be concerned to folks is just with IDFA deprecation, you're not going to be able to get as much for hyper casual. And Frank Jabot spent a lot of time talking up hyper casual, but the reason why you're able to, like hyper casual games were able to generate money is because you're able to find whales in hyper casual games through the targeting. Once that goes away, yeah, and you can't get those whales in, in, in your hyper casual audience, like the CPMs should drop significantly. And yeah. not only that, but there are people who believe that Apple just hates hyper casual. They they just don't like hyper casual being, you know, showing up in the rankings. And so they're gonna that there's there's a belief, and you know, this is just speculation, but there's a belief that Apple will just kill off hyper casual, at least on the iOS side. So given all of those risks, I just think for me personally that Zynga at this point, I I wouldn't invest personally. Mm. Well, now would be a good time to say that I'm long Zynga. And <laughs> I'm long Zynga because I liked what the new management team was doing, honestly. And, you know, you explained it earlier, Joe. It's like they had a really good strategy of finding, like, kind of this middle market uh, yeah, studios yeah. to pick up. And, like, you know, they still had growth in them, right? And, like, that's been going pretty well for the last couple of years. Um, and I agree that, like, the door is kind of slammed on the ability for like 
small companies to replenish that without help, and they're going to need to pivot. I like that they have three potential avenues. I am skeptical about their ability to address sort of upmarket themes in their games. That's not in Zynga's DNA. Um, if in fact they have moved to a model where they're more hands-off, as you say, and they're able to do a good aqua hire, hire good core developers, right? And then do this cross-platform thing, it could work. But like honestly, doing a like a great cross-platform project, non-trivial, huge execution risk risk. And like it's it's just not what they've done historically. So I think it's gonna take them a while to figure it out. Um, when I hear Star Wars, I think, well, that's going to be expensive, right? Especially given who they've hired, you know, and and set up to do that. Uh, not not a cheap shot in the dark. They have the money to do it, and it makes sense sense strategically. Um, but it could take them a couple bites of the apple before they get it. Internationally, um, you know, Japan and Korea together, I think you can absolutely address. You can you can get growth there, um, and those two countries are both in their what is it top eight or top ten markets that we were looking at earlier. Uh, you don't see China, um, and getting into China non-trivial, right? Uh, especially for a Western company, you do have to cut a deal with a gatekeeper, and it can be quite painful. <laughs> it's it's not an easy thing to do, and uh, even once you get there, the market is fairly idiosyncratic, I would say. Um, specialists in the Chinese market, it t- they take a long time to m- kind of figure things out and make the right connections. Um, so that's another thing that could happen eventually, um, but I think will take time. I think of the three avenues, the walled garden thing is probably the most promising, um, but it's still probably one to two years away, right? It's, it's a ways out. Um, so it could be the case that Zynga is in for a rough couple of years, uh, in which case, I probably won't buy more, but I'll probably hold and, and wait to see if any of this bears fruit. Yeah, I actually think Zingle continue to roll just based upon the current. I mean, they, they've acquired a number of companies. They've got some games in the pipeline. So I think the yeah. next two years, in my opinion, are they'll be fine. It's just okay. like I'm thinking more the five, you know, the five year and longer time frame. That's why I'm just like, I don't see it right now. I just think yeah. that if you if I look at the the current valuation relative to the risks, I I just think that's a little bit out of whack. I think when you look at Zynga, as you said, for the next one to two years, you've got 10 to 15% organic growth kind of locked in, like with all the launches coming, plus just the trajectory of some of the forever franchises, like Harry Potter is still going to keep growing for a little bit because they've got that on solid footing. Even Words with Friends is growing because they launched a battle pass, a season pass within Words with Friends. (laughs) that's actually been extremely successful. Like, you know, laugh at it if you will, but it's actually been extremely successful. People are paying for this stuff. And so I I think they're- Words with enemies, that's all I can call it. (laughs) And and so they're, honestly, I'm I'm in Asia. My family's in Florida. That's the, I play Words with Friends with my parents every day. That's how we stay in touch every day as we play Mm. Words with Friends with each other. So it's actually been very useful for us during COVID. But I think that just looking at kind of what's in in line, um, plus when you look at all the, large studio organizations, these city states, they've, they've acquired Peak, Graham, Small Giant. You know, I, I think there's more to come from these organizations now that they've settled, their big games are, are mature, they're on stable footing, and now they can start making new games. But these are all coin flips at this point. You know, these are all call options. You know, how many of these are going to be successful? Yeah. We don't know. We don't know anything about them. And so it's going to be a while. You know, the risk is this becomes like Supercell, right? Where they had a couple of really successful titles and they failed to do anything meaningful after that just because they got as big as they could get without doing something dramatically different. At least Zynga is trying to do something dramatically different. They're trying to make games for other platforms. They're trying other genres. They're trying other regions. Um, you know, they're definitely shooting their shot. It's not like they're just sitting there and milking what they have. Um, so you can't fault them for that. But how much of this is going to be successful is 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 a big question mark. And you know, that's that's where I agree with Joe. When you look out five years from now, you don't really know what this business looks like from a growth perspective because it's you just have no idea. But by the same token, you can say that about a lot of gaming companies in general. I don't think that's unique to Zynga, particularly ones that are going to be so reliant on new releases to drive any meaningful growth. Yeah. 
I mean, you know, it's not like Zynga's in danger. They've got so much revenue coming from Forever Franchise, stable business. They're live ops experts, right? I mean, they built a significant core competency around that. But, you know, yeah. that engine now in terms of what they had, they had the live ops expertise and an M&A engine. And the M&A engine is just kind of like, you know, Shut down. <laughs> and this, this thing fed that. It's just like, okay, here's more stuff that you guys can live operate and add your expertise to. Right. And, you know, that engine's kind of kind of broken now. So, And, and maybe, and maybe you know, with the ad network, um, as Steve, you were referencing, you know, if, if, for example, if Tactile or someone like that is in their network and they see good things and they buy them, then that's obviously intriguing. But, like, you know, if you just look at, like, Zynga's multiples and their margins and you compare it to AAA publishers when you adjust for all the accounting differences between mobile game makers and, and AAA publishers, gross versus net revenue, et cetera, um, you know, there still is room for Zynga to, you know, improve their EBITDA margins, particularly after they get through 2021 and early 22 when they're spending heavily on new game marketing. Um, you know, that, that's, that headwind eases next year. You know, a lot of their big games are going to be quite large scale at that point. There's a lot of room for margins to 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 continue to scale up. And I think that's another thing that, you know, people don't necessarily talk about because it's all about growth, growth, growth. But, you know, I, I think there is a there, there's a lot of levers still to pull for margin expansion for Zynga. And that's going to be massively accretive to their free cash flow. If they do run out of acquisition targets they have bought back stock in the past. And, you know, I know a lot of people love stock buybacks. I wouldn't be surprised if stock buybacks resumed if they do, you know, shift their focus, like we were talking about, to organic for the next couple of years. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they start buying back stock much more aggressively. So they turn into a value stock and like post a dividend and all of that. <laughs> I don't I don't think they'd be at the point of a dividend yet. Buybacks are a good start. You know, sure. EA just started a dividend last year and EA has oh, yeah. been doing this for how long, right? So, you know, there, there's a long way to go to get there. But, you know, I think a good start would be some buybacks because um, they, I think their cash flow, you know, is very predictable at this point because their forever franchises print money. So they don't have to worry about, um, you know, the cash flow going down again like they did three, four years ago when they didn't have a dozen or so forever franchises. All right. Well, I think that's basically it. So kind of negative on my side. Steve, I think you're you're positive. Matthew, I don't know if you can publicly state your, your opinion. I, I I like the Zynga. I've liked the Zynga story for a long time because mm -hmm. I liked the right. how efficient they were at yeah. reinvesting excess cash into acquisitions. Obviously that's yeah. not the story anymore. But I think given the the visibility for the next 12 to 24 months on the new game pipeline. Um, there's still reason to be bullish. Um, but when you get beyond, to your point, when you start thinking about what's beyond that, there's more uncertainty. And that means that in call it six months to eight months, investors will start also worrying about that. Because once we get into 22, people will already start looking at 23. And if there's nothing else that we're excited about in 23, then people will start to become worried about what the growth looks like down the road. And, and so that that's kind of a key point of their fiscal year, you know, their year end 2021 earnings and their 2022 guidance and then kind of their longer term guidance they give with that, I think will be a huge uh, inflection point for Zynga going forwards in terms of, OK, we, we now we have these other three games in our pipeline that we're going to talk to you about or our teams are still working. They don't have anything that that that's going to be a big make or break moment for Zynga, I think. Yeah. But to your point earlier about margin expansion, it'll be the case also that some of the uh, earnout money is going to come off the books over time, right? Uh, especially if they stop buying studios. So like they, their finances should improve just naturally. Uh, I, that just occurred to me. So that's kind of like, well, it's long run, it's a bad thing, but <laughs> in the short run, like it can shore up their position, right? Although I'm not sure if investors are really looking at that in term, because, you know, when you have your adjusted EBIT down, remember, you had all that stuff back. Okay, got it. So, um, <laughs> Rookie mistake. Anyway. <laughs> it's also below free cash flow on the cash flow statement. Does it, it, ah. it's, a, uh, it's a financing cash flow, actually. It's not, a, uh, it's not an operating cash flow. Okay, all right. Tricky, tricky. All right, well, guys, I think that's it. Matthew, thank you so much again for joining us. And yeah, thank you. There we are. There we have it. Super Stonk Brothers, episode nine in the books. Catch y'all next time. Bye. Bye.